Wow, wow, wow. This is Trav Bell, the bucket list guy. I've just finished our latest podcast with Senior Sergeant Daryl Green of TwiceShot.com. Uh, yeah, Twice Shot. He was shot in the face and has recovered. He goes into his recovery, the big life lessons that he's learnt, how it has changed him and how it's led him to then inspire others as a motivational speaker. We talk everything from... Uh, his first public speaking appearance when he was uh, in grade eight, through to him wowing audiences right across Australia right now. I tell you what, this story is one to one to really listen to. Uh, it's gaining popularity. He's 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 still a practicing senior, senior sergeant. Um, he's been awarded all kinds of uh, awards for his bravery, as you'll hear. A really good bloke. And, uh, and then of course we finish off with talking about what's on his bucket list. So pay attention, have fun, and get into it. Welcome to the Bucket List Life Podcast with Trav Bell, the world's number one bucket list expert. Bucket List Life's mission is to help you get off the treadmill, stop groundhog days, hack your habits, and live a regret-free life. Because we know life's way too short not to live your bucket list life. So please welcome your host, Trav Bell, the Bucket List Guy. Hey, bucket listers, this is Trav Bell, the Bucket List Guy. On behalf of our global bucket lister community, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Bucket List Life podcast. As part of the Bucket List Life podcast, we're out there, you know, we're talking to people that are out there living their list, hacking the life experience to give you, the listener, an inspiration, motivation to play a bigger game. And I'm so stoked. On today's show, we talk to Daryl Green. Now, he his website is twice shot. We'll get into that in a second. He left school at 18. He joined the police force. He's now 42, a senior sergeant. And uh, he's recently been crowned with a, a national Kerry Nguyen uh, scholarship winner. I think I said that right. Kerry Nguyen scholarship winner at the National Speakers Association Awards just recently. That's where Daryl and I met. He, uh, he's a motivational speaker, and you'll see why. And he speaks about resilience, as you'll hear. His story is famous. It's been featured on ABC's Australian Story, ABC Radio, Radio Channel 9, Channel 7, Channel 10, uh, a lot of the news. And uh, look, a little known fact that he actually started his public speaking in grade 8, but was quickly uh, pulled off the stage in front of the class because he swore. He's a copper. I don't think too much has changed. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Hi, Trev. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and you can swear on this show, mate. It's all good. <laughs> uh, my, I, I have sworn a few times, and especially after that person put that gun to my head, I dropped the C-bomb and I dropped the F-bomb, but it's okay. <laughs> my mum has forgiven me. <laughs> and what I, uh, you know, Daryl and I became mates like straight away after we met each other at the um, the recent, recent National Speakers uh, Association conference up there in Canberra. Yeah, we had a, a a few late night liqueurs, mate, and that, uh, and we just talked, uh, basically talked shit for a couple of hours. It was great. Yeah, mate, talking about life and your goals, and yeah. uh, because what you talk about, I try to live, and I've also had people say some things to me. You haven't had my experience. Oh, you want to concentrate on your your career? Like, I'll, I'll do the travel once I retire. Yeah, you may not yeah. get there. <laughs> and what do you say to those people, mate? Be, going through what you've been through, when the when your uh, your colleagues and we're just speaking off air there, your your colleagues are saying, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that travel when I'm retired. I'll do my bucket list later on in life." What do you say to that? Well, it it, de- it depends if on on the person. If I feel I can really make an impact, I'll say something. Yeah. So many people are tied up with their lives doing. 60 hour weeks for a 40 hours pay to try to make that next career goal. Sometimes I think it's it's not worth the effort. But certainly for people that I care about and certainly my audiences, I'll give an give an example of my life where yeah. you may not get there. And so now's the time to start living. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. You are you are more than qualified to talk about this too. Um, Three fifteen a.m. first of May. The year 2000, what happened? We had a routine job. It was a threats against a person. Very actual Norman policing for somebody to threaten to shoot and kill somebody else. The threat was 14 hours old. And so the longer a threat goes on, the less likely it is to occur. 
We've turned up at the scene and we've spoke to the person who had the threat delivered to them. And we had to do our due diligence to see, well, what do we do in the circumstances? Do we go and immediately kick the door down, search for this firearm that the person allegedly had? Or do we have to go and swear out a search warrant? So we were basically in the police car, all three of us. The sergeant was on his mobile phone talking to police communications. So the shooting was all recorded. Right. Sharnell, my partner, she was in the front seat. She was actually checking on the two people, the informant and the complainant, the people who gave us the information. And her side door of her car was open. I was in the back of the car. I was sat in the middle. My side door was open too. And I was listening to the information coming in, what was coming into Chris, what was coming into Charnel. The interior lights on because we had the two side doors open. And I heard this pat, pat, pat. And the only thing that made logical sense to me was, oh, that's got to be a dog, you know, neighborhood dog running up to the car. So I've turned, I've looked out the door. I couldn't see anything because of the interior light, but in an instant, my head's gone from looking out the door to the over to my far right hand side, over to around my knees. Yeah. I've got my hands around my mouth. There's blood. There's teeth. There's bone. I try oh. to open the the side door beside me. Child locks are on. I sit up. Chris is gone. Chanel's perfectly still, and it was like the Mary Celeste ghost ship, completely silent. I was actually suffering audio exclusion. We'd just been ambushed. I'd been shot uh, in the face, in the shoulder, my partner down the left-hand side, and the sergeant twice. Oh, wow. You got shot in the face. That's a, I just cannot fathom that. And I've seen pictures of it, and we're going to po be posting a, a very um, uh, interesting diagram that you've got up there on, uh, on YouTube of, of the clip. And you got shot in the tail. And where did the, where did the bullet go? Uh, it, it entered, uh, it hit the maxillofacial bone, which is just below the nose and, and to the left side of my face. So I was oh. quite lucky, the strong part of the face, and it's further luck, it deflected down and it entered into my tongue. And what really went in our favour, I don't know much about firearms, I've just done firearms with the police, but the experts at the academy said to me, what really saved all three of you was he had a homemade silencer on them. They're notorious for being inefficient. If he never had that, that bullet would have kept going, and they said, I'd be dead, Charnel would have been dead, and the sergeant would have been very, very sore. So the, the silencer, what slowed down slowed down the um, the bullet? The round, yeah, the twenty two round. It was a, a rifle round. Shit. I'll, I'll say shit on behalf of the whole audience right now. So you got shot in the face and where? In, in your shoulder? And in my left, uh, left arm. Oh, no way. Mate, never even felt one. <laughs> how do you and so um and so your partners how they pull up well or... i'm pleased to say we are all still in the police yeah right wow and and i will one of the things i talk about adversity it generally yeah. does one of two things we experience together it splits people apart or brings you together yeah and it brought us together quick story Chanel got married in 2010. She asked us to come to the wedding. We said, yeah. of course we will. We've yeah. come over there. The uh, first night, everybody's gone back after dinner. Chris and I, we've gone out drinking. Yeah. We've come home at 6 a.m. in the morning. We've jumped into these uh, big beds we had in this one big room. And then there's a knock on the door a few hours later. And Chris, uh, it's housekeeping. And Chris says, oh, come back at uh, 4 o'clock. We'll be, we'll be gone by then. We've got a wedding. Oh, excuse me, sir. It's 20 to 4 now. Chris's, <laughs> Chris's watch had been wound back. So uh, I never got showered, shaved so quickly in my life. Chris put the, he's a bit slow on me, put the clothes on from the night before. We ran up to the top of the resort. We jumped in a golf cart and we made it to, at 4 o'clock to the wedding. <laughs> and what did Chanel say, for us, say to us? She said, you bastards. I would have delayed my wedding just to make sure you two were here. Oh, legendary, legendary, so, isn't that? That's Australian mateship right there, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, mate. So how you were out of action, like bang straight to months. hospital. Uh, you, you know, uh, well, what's the process of recovery from that? Well, I had five months in the hospital. Oh, sorry, five five days in the hospital. Two days in intensive care, yep. and then I was off work for uh, 20 months. Wow. I went through a first reconstruction. I actually had two reconstructions over four years. I had 17 major operations. And But one of the things I talk about, I show a picture when I speak. Yeah. And it shows me at home a couple of uh, weeks after the shooting, and I'm smiling. And all you can see is I'm missing three teeth. Yeah. 
And some people put that together and, and thought, geez, Greeny's having it easy. He's only got three missing teeth, 20 months off work. <laughs> what I say to audiences, I say to them, well, I'll show you what I was going through in that 20 month. I yeah. stepped it through all the uh, operations and then I show them uh, a poster operative photograph of, of oh, my gosh. face all blowing up after the first uh, bone transplant. Oh, 17 operations, no way. And you wouldn't like, uh, you know, to look at your... Uh, it doesn't look like you've been touched. No, very fortunate. The uh, the round actually just sort of split the lip, yep. so there was no internal, external damage. And I had some what-if scenarios. This guy, Perotti, who shot us, he'd been uh, pictured with holding shotguns. He'd been out bush. And I've seen people who survived shotguns to the face, and that gave me many uh, a late night and thinking about that. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And, mate... So um, you got the award for bravery. Tell me about the award, the highest, uh, the highest award that you can get. I received the Valor Award, the highest Valor Award for Valor in the Queensland Police Service, yep. as did Charnel and Dark for all of our actions. Mine was awarded on the night because I, after I got shot, I actually took out my service revolver. I went after the gunman. I couldn't find him. I then was looking for the sergeant, and when I... I uh, couldn't find him. I actually confronted two people on the street. I had to send them back to their houses. Meanwhile, and, I, and you're, what, you're bleeding. You've just been shot in the face. Yep, I'm bleeding. Oh, and um, I'm go. <laughs> talk, yeah. And this is all recorded on audio. And they couldn't actually understand in the audio what I was saying as I was screaming out later in it. And it was calling out, Chris, Chris, Chris. I was looking for the sergeant. My mouth was so banged up. I've come back to the bonnet of the police car. Charnel sat there. I'm holding my mouth. I'm bleeding all over the bonnet. Now, I didn't feel that I could go and give her first aid, but she said, Greeny, I'm hurt. And I thought, well, I know she's alive. Yeah. And I said to her, Chanel, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Yeah. And she told me years later, she said, I was thinking at that time, no, it's not. You don't see yourself. You're pouring blood all over the bonnet of that vehicle. Yeah. It's not a very reassuring sight. <laughs> oh, God. So... You know, like, uh, what about, you know, I, I've read in the notes there that it, um, yeah, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, depression, you know, what happened there, mate? What really happened, the first couple of uh, weeks, it was like cloud nine. It was just surreal. It's like I won lotto but the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. But then a real tragedy occurred. A, a officer named uh, Norm Watt, a dog squad officer in Rockhampton, attended a domestic violence incident. He got shot once in the leg, cut the femoral artery. You got four minutes to, until you bleed out. Norm unfortunately bled out, died, and I think I've reflected on this and I thought we've been shot multiple times. We all lived. He died. Yeah. And this just led to a deep downward spiral of uh, depression, anger, anxiety. Yeah. I was a, uh, I was a, a real mess and uh, fortunately I, I've always had the attitude of trying to, to help yourself and do something. I, I have sat around and felt sorry for myself, got me nowhere, I realised that. I went and saw a psychiatrist yeah, and he said, hey, you need high level support. Stay with your mum and dad, and so um, yeah. mum and dad have been there uh, through me through thick and thin. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna ask you too. Like, what what do you find out about yourself, and and also about others in the process of of recovering from something like this? You can go a couple of ways uh, with it. Yeah, I'd imagine. And yeah. a lot of I know stories of a lot of people who've uh, haven't had the support and maybe haven't had the the right attitude and you know, taken the drugs to alcohol and left. I know one lady who was went to the Port Arthur shooting in Tasmania. Yeah, right. And she uh, couldn't look at a Tasmanian police vehicle and she didn't talk about it, didn't seek help until it was too late and she left. And she came up here and she joined the Queensland Police as a facilitator, teaching yeah. recruits as a, a civilian. So she did get her life back in order and helped herself, but she lost her career down there from from not do, being proactive. Really? So yeah. when I've looked back at my life, I've always been a problem solver. And fortunately, uh, and I've always... Not only being a problem solver, I've had this tenacity of not giving up. And those are two things that stood me in good stead. So with the support of my parents, those two attributes, yeah. I got myself out of a pit. And, well, actually, it was a real up and downwards journey as, as I talk. And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And what do you find out about other people? A lot of people, uh, you know, you obviously got the immediate support from your parents. How were the other coppers you know, towards you? Oh, a lot of them were shell shocked too. Brought back their own mortality. A lot of people didn't want to talk to me about. It. They were so afraid of saying the wrong thing. It was eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. It was very uncomfortable for Come me. Come when people get it. You know, we we sorry, mate. We, we just had a um, Andy who was on a previous show. Uh, you know, go through go through cancer. He's had um, testicular cancer and all sorts of things. We've had another cancer survivor on here. Um, it's it's like that uh, elephant in the room. Don't talk about it. That's what happened with you. It, it, you're exactly right. And I'll give you a classic example. Yeah. I was at the academy in 2006, and one of my mates, we worked together as young constables. He was a firearms instructor. He got promoted to sergeant, training recruits, yeah. and he said to his boss in an off-cuff conversation, you know what, I might go ask Daryl, see if he's got any lessons from the shooting he was involved in to pass them to my recruits. Yeah. And senior sergeants turned around and said, oh, don't ask Daryl, go ask his manager. So they've come to my civilian manager. What have they done? Oh, you want to ask Daryl about the shooting? Ah, let's go see the inspector. So I went and saw the inspector, big bear of a man, Dave Stevenson, the finest interpersonal skills of anyone I've ever met. And, he's, <laughs> and he said... Why don't we ask Daryl, empower the man? And that was a huge turnaround. So talking was actually the turning point for me. And luckily, Dave, Inspector Dave Stevens had come into my life, and he actually asked, he said, oh, do you mind if I come along? It, it might help me be a better boss for you if I you know, hear your story. Yeah. And it certainly did. And he was one who wouldn't shy away from the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and that's one of my lessons now that I'm so passionate about, having courageous conversations. Hey, yeah. if somebody has loses a child through drowning and then there's something on the news, ask them about it. Say, hey, uh, I saw that program the other night. How would you feel about it? And, and people will talk about it and, and talking so healthy. Yeah, I mean, you'd know that. Uh, how, how do you um, – what's the I, – I, yeah, here's, here's a little thing that no one knows about me. I was going to – I, I, I shared this with you when we caught up, mate, was – you know, I was going to, before doing personal training all those years ago, I was going to join the police force as well. And I, how, do you, how do you feel going to, going to work every day now and, and uh, the potential threat, the fear associated with what could happen? Well, I returned to work in a non-confrontation area. I worked in, in investigating internet pedophilia. Then I moved to the academy and it was a very long process, but I challenged myself. Yep. And that's one of the lessons I speak about is, is responsibly challenging yourself to overcome your fears. I had a lot of fears about police incidences, especially around firearms. So what did I do? I volunteered or applied to become a firearms instructor. Yeah. And that yeah. placed me in some very intense moments in a controlled environment. And I didn't respond like a normal person. However, I had support. I had coping mechanisms. I did successfully complete that, uh, that course became a firearms instructor, and uh, then a short time later had an opportunity to go back and do operational policing. And one night was amazing. I was five minutes from Hanbury Street where the shooting took place. I was on Gympie Road at Chermside. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was about midnight, so close to the time, and the ambience was so similar with the street light overhead, our rotating lights going, the blue and the red, with this card we intercepted. And previously in the early days after the shooting, Flashing lights at a nightclub would give me panic attacks because yeah. of bringing that night back. Yeah, but right. here I was, nine years on, back with the same ambience, and there was no triggers. I thought about it the next day, and I thought, oh, my God, I've come so far. It's a long journey. It was nine years, but now I'm good with it. I still don't uh, like to – I don't want to constantly face drunks and – yeah. And and violence. I've got, I've done that fair share of, of my time. I'll go back and supervise that. But it's time for you know the, the younger coppers uh, to you know do their bit, go to their domestics and go to their drink driving, and go to their fatal traffic accidents. So it's also knowing a little bit about yourself. I don't want to overload myself because hey, there's still a lot of baggage there from the shooting that I have to work yeah. through with yeah. health strategies, running, eating, spending time with friends. How's the environment out there for, for cops these days? This is sort of off topic, but you know, is it is it getting is it getting more unsafe? Uh, is society imploding more, or you know, what's your views on that? The large majority of the community is fantastic. They really are. Unfortunately, we only deal with that small minority of the community 
who uh, don't want to play by the rules and don't want to treat people with respect or fairness. So we received the, the brunt of that. And it's a real shame because I've had such things as I was coming home on the train, I was working in police headquarters, I'd come home in uniform, and there was a young group of kids, you know, about three or four of them, 15, and they uh, made snorting noises like there was, uh, you know, there's the pigs. Yeah. And uh, I didn't speak to them about it, but at the time it really did upset me. Yeah. Uh, because I know that they're, they're at an at-risk, you know, uh, group. The age they're in, the drugs and the environment, and yeah. when things go wrong, they're going to call us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Quite hypocritical, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you'd hate to think what's been passed down from the parents, but uh, let's not get all high and mighty here. Hey, look, switching gears, switching gears. Uh, what um, what gives you inspiration? Mate, that's pretty easy for me. I like. Simple, beautiful things. So right now, on my wallpaper of my computer, I have a beautiful aerial view of Tahiti. Right. And I love travel. And so when I go travel and I stay in Asia, I'm just about always on a beach or very close to a beach. Yeah. I love skiing. I love the exhilaration of that. And it's beautiful scenery. You're a Queenslander and you ski. My brother lives in the UK and I've only ever skied in <laughs> North America and Europe. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, this, the, it really is a symbol. It's another one is uh, meals, food. Last night uh, I come home and I uh, cooked myself some uh, pork spare ribs and uh, for the entree I had some uh, dates wrapped in bacon. I had a nice bowl of red or well, half, a, half a bowl of red and, yeah, it's just really sucking the marrow out of life. And you can do things that aren't expensive to really enjoy your life. And I put on a, uh, a war documentary. Hey, I'm not a great date. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what girls come over for a war documentary? But th that time was about me. It was a really simple things in life. Yeah, yeah. And you, what you've got to, yeah. You know, I mean, this was a few years ago. Um, would you would you say your 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 perspective has changed since? Oh, c completely. Uh, yeah. I I had really like you know ten miserable years, and, and, and give me an example. I was told my first reconstruction was not un was unsuccessful and I'd have to go back under the knife. And they never even had a solution. I was devastated. Yeah. I had some feedback at work and they knew I had operations pending, but they had no idea. And the word got around, oh, what's wrong with Greeny? He's, uh, he's got no motivation. Yeah. Uh, nobody understands. There's no future for me. I uh, need to get some new skills. So I, I could have felt sorry for myself and turned to the bottle, but I yeah. didn't. Yeah. And I found a desk job at the academy as a, a, in training and I thought, right, I'm going to get some new skills. And I embarked on a Master of Applied Finance degree. So from 2000 and, uh, late 2003 to 2008, I lived at home with mum and dad. I commuted two hours a day. I did my daily work. I came home. And every night and every weekend, I studied this Master degree, degree of Applied Finance. So I pretty much had much of five years with not much joy in my life. I'd see yeah. my brother occasionally at the end of the semester. But life was... It was it was commute, it was work, and it was study. Yeah, and I become a very. And after that, I said, you know what? I've done my hard yards. I've got my qualifications, and uh, I continued on in the police because, again, you know, you, you can't control life. You control your attitude. Two thousand and eight. I'm ready to embark on a new career in finance. What's going on? The GFC is in full flight. So I refocused <laughs> on my police career. I was promoted in two years. But I made a commitment to myself that I was going to suck the marrow of a life. And I'll give you yeah, great. Yeah, give one us an example. example. Yeah. I, was, uh, I went to Germany in 2006 for the World Cup. And I was studying two finance subjects. I was there for seven weeks. And I'd go out trying to enjoy life, go on to the World Cup events in, in Berlin. And I was running one day. And I was running through a cemetery. And I saw all these... Uh, Graves of people, 1944, 1945, and I thought yeah. to myself, those people had their dreams and ambitions all before them, and they were all scotched out yeah. by an event they had no control of. And so I had said to me, that won't be me. And uh, I did. I, I, I dropped off from uh, thinking that way. But I do something every day now because I had some feedback at work probably about 12 months ago, and I was very disappointed in this feedback. They said, oh, you do your eight hours. I want you to concentrate on your career a little bit more. I'm yeah. sorry. I get paid for eight hours. I might do a little bit more. In emergency, I'll do more. But otherwise, 
I go to work to earn a living to enjoy life. And from that feedback, every day I drive past a First World War memorial. And I hold my hand out that every time looking at it and say living an inspiring life. Yeah. Of course, it's my daily reminder that we don't know when this wonderful thing that life is will be over. Yeah, great, great words, mate. Great words. And that's, uh, that's why we had those drinks and uh, why we connected so, uh, so well. Uh, you know, what, what, um, what, inspira- you know, what, what inspirational books have helped you? You got any favorite ones? Yes, mate. I love reading about uh, other people and what they've done and putting tools in my kit bag. The most recent one, one of the things I do is I talk about is having something to amazing to look forward to in life. And normally it's a trip for me or a ski trip. And I'll find a book, I'll put it on my coffee table, and I'll see it each day. So when it goes a little bit tough, I look at that and I'll know that I'll be stepping on a plane soon. I'll be drinking a scotch and dry and open that book up. And the most recent one was the book Unbroken, Louis Zamperini. Which oh, my is now God. How good was – did you see the movie? Yes, yeah, so, saw, saw the movie. The book's even better. Yep. Yeah, and so that's uh, the most recent one. Another one that I really like is "Touching the Void." It's a documentary on two mountain climbers in the 1980s in Patagonia yep. facing life and death, and basically neither of them gave up. Yeah, yeah. I'll put I'll put these links in the show notes too, guys, just so you can tap into that. What? Any others? When I look back and the bad news that I've received in life, there's probably one person I think back to say, they had the courage to say, no, nah, we're going to fight on. And that was when the Germans had occupied Western Europe and everybody thought the game was over, except Winston Churchill. Uh, yeah. I look to that example of how he went on. I've had some huge blows in my life, even in my police career. And that was one of them that fortified me. He said, look, if he can do that, yep. I can. He was a man who suffered depression too. You're right, and, right. And so he used to call it his black dog. And so he was – that gave me great inspiration. Another one, JFK. JFK had huge medical problems, but he overcame those to become you know, one of the best presidents I think the U.S. has ever had. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mate, you've turned it, you've turned it all around and – and now, now you're uh, you're you're well, not an up up and coming speaker. You're pretty bloody established. And you know, what what what's the core of your message when you're speaking to audiences? I have a lot of quotes that I've come up with myself from reflecting on my life, and that's one thing I've been able to do. I feel very fortunate. I've been able to distill what I did and the lessons I've learned. The number one lesson, though, is resilience is not strength. It's returning to strength. We will all get knocked down in life. And funnily enough, when I've had other blows, I've been able to look back at my life and thought, oh, hold on. Yes, I uh, was told I had to have the second reconstruction. I went through that. I was told... Oh, sorry, Trev, I'm losing. Um, <laughs> uh, right. I'll, I'll go back to my – okay. I arrived in India in 2004 to meet my girlfriend who had volunteered to nurse in Pakistan. Yeah. And she'd become very religious and she had an epiphany on the bus on the uh, way to a village. Yeah. Uh, and she flew from Karachi into Bombay. She's got there and she's met me and she said, I had this epiphany on the bus. I realised I'm highly religious you're not, there can be no future, I'm going back to the village. Oh, shit, you're right. So I've seen that. And then there was, uh, okay, sorry, but what I'll do is actually there's three things that I really look look, look back on, on myself and say Daryl Green's a bit of all right. And the first one <laughs> is I've got, I've got a lot of courage. I'm really yeah. proud of myself that yeah. on the night after I got shot, what I did, got out of the car, went after the gun and protected my colleagues. That was the first one. And that was an instantaneous kind of uh, knee-jerk reaction too, which has uh, come from somewhere. Yep. So I've got a good character. I like that. The second one was I completed a master's degree in finance part-time while was whilst working full-time battling depression and all the other things that comes with PTSD. 
T. So mm. not only do I have a pretty good noggin on my head, I've got some tenacity to keep going. Yeah. And, and finally, the, the, when I look back at myself physically, I climbed Kilimanjaro in uh, 2013 for charity. Yeah, yeah. 20, 24 hours before the final climb, you were seeing Kilimanjaro at midnight. I went to bed at uh, 7 p.m. At 11 p.m., I woke up. I had a mouthful of vomit. I had to open my tent door and bring everything up. I had uh, violent vomiting and diarrhea until 5 a.m. in the morning. Was that because of the altitude? No, nothing to do with the altitude. I just, I just eaten something. One well, of the other guys, home. Mark Streeting, he'd had it a couple of days earlier. Yeah, right, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I climbed it. I said to myself, um, I, I can't stay here. I've got to do this. And uh, so phys- physically, I should have been just in bed. Yeah. But that was the physical achievement of doing that. So I've got a lot of physical stamina and mental determination. So yeah, those are the cool. three biggies I look back in life, Trev. Yeah, yeah, cool. Love it. Who do you who do you love speaking to? You know, like what what audiences are on your bucket list, mate? I actually love speaking to corporate audiences yep. because it gets to show them, you know, what's it like to be a police officer. Like most people have thought, geez, wouldn't mind being a police officer or what it's like. Yeah. So, so it builds a lot of uh, respect and, and, and trust w- w- with those people. And there's so much that goes on in the corporate environment, and especially sweating the small stuff mm. that people can take away. And the feedback has been, I want to communicate to my people so much. I want to live more about my life. The long hours – Hey, there's times you need to do it, but yeah. you don't need to do it your entire life. Yeah, yeah. School, sure. school children, I love giving these lessons starting out in life. If I had a few more of these lessons, like getting a mentor, it would have made my uh, my life that little bit easier. Mate, uh, you're an absolute inspiration. And um, just in wrapping up, any final things you wanna you wanna share with the the listeners here, buddy? One one second, Trev. I'm just going to look up a uh, a, a quote from my uh, site. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And what is your site? What's your main site, by the way? Twiceshot.com. Twice. And if people want to, they can sign up uh, and stay, stay in contact. Uh, yep. Occasionally receive a, a free newsletter, but uh, they'll be able to follow my uh, journey as a uh, emerging uh, professional motivational speaker. Yep. Yep. Cool. Cool. And uh, you're mostly doing corporate keynotes at the moment, corporate keynotes and within the police force as well? Yeah, I am uh, I do emergency services. I'm next talking to uh, 200 correctional officers in Townsville at the end of the month. Oh. I speak internally to the police and uh, I do run a workshop, but I'm also working on a very new exciting venture. I'm collaborating with Marie de Guzman. She's a neuroscientist and we are doing a, a workshop to uh, build corporate resilience using my lived experience and her expertise showing what the brain does under these pressures what you can do and how the brain function actually improves with uh taking positive steps oh wow look forward to that unreal there's a flyer on the website in relation to that website to that All right. yeah we'll put that uh, we'll put that website on the uh the show notes here guys you've got that quote there mate mate i'm uh I just made bloody caps locks on my computer, so I'm just getting into the <laughs> bloody hell. That's all right. Get it. You're gonna get it tattooed on yourself, like I've got one on my forearm here, mate, and you never forget it. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't it doesn't say such as life either, like uh, our friend. Um. All right. So. Uh, one. Which one do I want to do? Uh, be give brave. us your favorite. Give us your favorite quote. Let's go. Because your experience. Sorry, mate. Just one, one second. All right. Cool. Cool. So you're you're still a practicing police officer, yeah? I am. I, I have to go to work today. I start work at uh, two p.m. Oh, wow. I'm a uh, duty officer at the non-urgent contact centre for uh, the Queensland Police. Right. Right. And uh, how long? How long do you reckon you'll be a copper for? I'm focusing on my police career, and I'm giving back to the community through my speaking. Yeah. And we'll just uh, see where 
Okay. My journey in life takes me, but it's very, very exciting, especially being honoured as an emerging speaker with the Kerry Nan Scholarship. That's 12 months of development. Yeah. So what's this space? Yeah, yeah, love it. The, love quote, it. the quote I would like to share with your listeners, yep. but I think I'll get the most out of, yep. when times become tough or complex, simplify your life in the short term. Love it. By employing the win principle – to ride out your difficulties and triumph now over adversity. The win principle is comes from sports in the US. It's what's important now. Nice. And I talk a lot about having, having healthy routines, running, eating well, etc. But there's going to be times when you need to prioritize. And this happened for me with the Kerry Nan Scholarship. I've come back from overseas. I have four days to put it together. I looked like a hermit in a cave. I had a long grown beard. I was eating uh, – <laughs> <laughs> microwave food, but I put in a guts effort. I got lots of feedback, and I was successful. And yeah. then I went back to my normal healthy routines. A yeah. lot of people just give up when it gets tough. They say, well, I can't do everything. I can't be healthy. I can't run. I can't see my family. Well, sometimes, yeah, stop that for a short period, concentrate on what's right and important, and then go back to it. Yeah, cool, cool. Love it, mate. Look, uh, we're going to have to end things there. You're an absolute legend, uh, you know, and you know, I, uh, you, you breathe, you, you, you shed a really good light on, um, on the police force, mate. You're a shining example of uh, what I hope you all represent, and um, you know, thanks, thanks for protecting us all. Like I'm representing the whole of Australia here, but you know what I mean. Thanks for protecting us all, and. Thanks for sticking your neck out that night. Um, and that bravery award uh, couldn't have got, gone to a better bloke. Um, thanks for being a good mate. Thanks for ha thanks for getting me drunk the other night. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I can't wait to see your development. You know, in the in the speaking circles. And and don't be a stranger. If you need any help, just let me know. Trev, thank you so much, mate. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to your audience and thanks for what you're doing because what you say, what you believe, what you do, mate, I'm exactly there with you. Yeah. And uh, my my next thing is I, I, I was going to go to South America and see uh, the largest live volcano, but <laughs> I'm, I'm putting that off to next year. But I will be taking a little bit of time out and relaxing on a beautiful beach this year, probably somewhere in, in, in the Philippines and uh, do something like go swim with some uh, whale sharks. Yeah, I might join you on that one. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot right. again, Daryl.